Hi, I'm Tammy of the Tammy Tell Me True Show, and I'm here with Muhammad Ali in spirit and my pimple Karen, who hasn't left yet. And I'm going to start off the day in my coffee and tea nook, and I'm going to show you some really delicious ways to zhuzh up your coffee. Then you're going to meet my friend Estelle, who I've been dying to introduce you to. And then I'm going to make the most delicioso Italian stew that I invented with my friend Deborah when I was on Weight Watchers, and it is bellissimo. You're going to love it. Let's make some coffee. Okay, so here's my a Muhammad Ali cup that I got from the Muhammad Ali Center in Louisville. And that's my second cup, clearly, in case you couldn't tell. Um, but let's talk about sweeteners. So you know how I'm about sugar and artificial sweeteners and sugar substitutes. So um, basically I'm gonna show you a couple options. All can be delicious, it all depends on what you like and how you are with artificial sweeteners or not, okay? Of course there's Tarani, everybody loves Tarani, and it's great, but there's not a lot of sugar-free options. Um, even on Amazon, there's basically like hazelnut, vanilla, um, a few basic ones, and they're great, but I like this one way better. Um, this is Jordan's Skinny Syrup, and they have a lot of really good flavors. This one is butter toffee. Um, they have one that's maple something. It's, it's really, really good. And they, of course, have basic ones as well. Um, and so those are, you know, some of your super low options. And again, those are delicious, but moderation, especially for me. So I'm a big fan of stevia, but my new favorite thing is monk fruit sugar. I mean, where's monk fruit sugar been my whole life? Monk fruit sweetener is, here's a couple bags, but this is classic, a classic white sugar, and then this is gold, and it basically is meant to replace raw cane sugar and then, you know, white sugar. And it's basically measure for measure, meaning it's um, a sweetener that you measure the exact same as you would sugar. Um, it's really, really good. The one thing I've noticed, though, is that it's not great in um, a large amount in coffee. So, for example, I like my, my coffee sweet. And so, of course, I would be putting two teaspoons of artificial sweetener or sugar substitute in my coffee. Two teaspoons of this that you start to have a little aftertaste. But I love it in my tea. Um, and I also, um, again, if I'm, once I start weaning off of, of liking things that are more sweet, I can basically start using this in my coffee. But it's really, really good. Um, I don't know where you can find it in the stores, but it's definitely online. And again, I like stevia. So now... What's the alternative to using these sweeteners that have flavors, right? Because these are flavors with the sucralose. So here's what I've worked out as far as flavors. So, you know, there's not a ton of options, but for example, this brand Pure is maple flavored syrup that is stevia based. Very, very good. You can use that in coffee or iced coffee. Um, you have this new Naturals Cocoa Syrup. I find that this one, you need a lot more of it and the flavor isn't as strong but you can always add, here's some cocoa powder. I happened to pick this one up. I thought it was fun because it's Nestle's and I thought, well, that kind of makes it more fun, but you can use any, any kind, of course. Of course, there's cinnamon. Um, these are great, these liquid stevias. There's a little vanilla and caramel. Now the liquid stevia, I actually find to be more palatable. For some reason, um, I don't know, maybe someone can write in and tell me why or I'll just Google it. But the liquid stevias don't um, have as much of an aftertaste and a bitter taste, so I like that. But it does take a little more than it says on the bottle. Like it says something like it takes five drops and I find that it, I need a little bit more than that. Um, but that's great. Here's another liquid stevia that's just straight up stevia without flavor, but then you can play with flavors. This is really good Madagascar bourbon vanilla extract, and it's really good. It's it's Nielsen Massey, and you can get that online as well. Really, really good. So if you put that in with your sweetener, then you've got your iced coffee, and then of course, or, or regular coffee. I drink a lot of iced coffee, that's why I said that. Um, but basically then, of course, I use um, coconut almond milk for my creamer. Um, I'm not really good with, with milk and, and lactose products, but I use stuff like that. Um, keeps it low calorie. And then, of course, there's packets of stevia. There's packets of Splenda, which I don't have on display here, but I do have on hand in case I want it or in case someone comes over uh, and wants the stevia packet. And it's there in case you want it. And again, in moderation, sucralose is doable, but again, it really will mess with your stomach if you have too much of it.
Okay, so now let's make some coffee. I have the Nespresso maker because um, George Clooney. And um, so let's make a pod. I use decaf now because I'm very sensitive to caffeine these days. I'm trying to really stay away from it for my acid reflux, but it's just as delicious. It tastes to me exactly the same and it's even better than Nespresso maker. So we've got our Nespresso maker ready. Love it. I also love Danny DeVito too. Those were the two in the ads, but George Clooney. So oh, yeah. And he's also a very nice guy. I've worked with him. Super lovely man. Okay, so this is ready. Takes a little of the nicest thing about this Nespresso maker, by the way. I don't work for Nespresso, so I'm not trying to sell you one, but it, it makes it creamy. Like it's a very delicious. Um, okay, so I'm gonna make my standard, the one I make the most, okay? So first of all, again, this is this bourbon vanilla stuff. Now you wanna be very sparing with this because it's strong. I'm also an eyeballer. I don't measure, but if you need to measure, of course you can. But I know my, I know my amounts here. So I just put a little bit in. And then put my stevia. I'm a little eye jacker. It feels very like I'm a pharmacist with this one. I usually get about, I don't know if you can see that, about half of a dropper full. Well, about three or four squirts. Again, you'll know what you like. And then my coconut almond milk. Very yummy. And here's my very fancy little tea and coffee spoon. I'm just gonna give it a little stir. You don't wanna, I don't wanna disrupt this foam, but you might not have foam. It could be with regular coffee, it's fine. And then I like to do the typical little cinnamon on top because cinnamon is always nice and it's very good for you, as you probably already know. And there you go, delish, enjoy. Mm. Ooh, so today's guest is a big gun. We met in college 30 years ago, uh, actually more than 30 years ago. We lived together junior and senior year. And not only does she have an inspirational story uh, because of her weight loss success, but it's inspirational on how we reconnected. Because of course, after college, we went our own separate ways. Um, and then of course, as most people do, reconnecting on Facebook. And when I first saw her on Facebook again, I was blown away. Like, wow, she looks exactly like she did in college. And little did I know that she had had bariatric surgery. Didn't know it. And then fast forward to me uh, posting more recently on my Facebook page, the beginnings of my journey with the vlog that I had started. And she reached out to me and she says, hey, I want to, I want to support you in your, in your journey because I had bariatric surgery 10 years ago and I'd love to help you in any way I can. Well, immediately I called her and, you know, three hours later, like you do when you first catch up with a friend that you haven't talked to in a million years, um, we're just, we're all caught up and it's like no time has passed at all. And she just has such a great, you know, not only a great story inspirationally, but she has some really good information um, and I want you to meet her very badly. So let's meet Estelle. Estelle, it's so good to see you. I'm still getting used to seeing your face. It, you know, um, I'm so happy to have you on the show. And, you know, I know this is going to sound all mushy, but I'm just so happy to have you back in my life. I mean, people's, people go into different directions and, and then they come back. And a lot of times it's for a reason. And this is definitely for a reason. I'm thrilled too. I know. It's great. So, so how much weight did you lose? Um, well, Prior to surgery, I was required to lose 10%, and I lost a little bit more than 10%. Uh, so I ended up losing 25 uh, pounds before surgery. And mind you, I had never lost more than 15 pounds on any program I'd ever been on. And it really was the, the excitement of knowing that this wasn't going to be regained. And then after surgery, I... I lost uh, about 100 pounds, and um, I'm only 5'2", so uh, 100 pounds was significant enough to put me in a, in a normal weight range. Amazing. Do you have, you have before and after photos that you can show us? I do. I do. Uh, here's a before photo. Wow. Wow. Yeah. And like me. this was my lowest weight. I mean, it's like that's how you looked in college. It's oh. Crazy. You know what? I would run into people in the grocery store shortly after my surgery, 
and they wouldn't know who I was. And then I ran into a couple of people from high school and they instantly knew how I was, <laughs> what, uh, who I was. And it, I felt younger partially because people reacted to me that way. Also, uh, so I uh, had the surgery 10 years ago and I was fortunate not to have any regain until recently, uh, maybe in the last year or two. Uh, so this would be more of a, of a current um, photo of me. Right, right. But I mean. But, uh, about 20, 25 pounds of regain. Yeah, yeah. Which, I mean, you still look great to me. And, and I mean, you're still healthy. It's still, you know. You know what? I, I can't possibly complain that I'm not at my lowest weight because I've had a whole lifestyle change and I have a perspective of where I was. And uh, during my lifetime, I have this tool and I may go up and down a little bit as long as I don't uh, forget to use my tool and get out of control. Right, right. So we, we've talked about this a little bit, but will you share with everyone what your defining moments were that led you to bariatric surgery? Because they're, they're pretty profound. Sure. Well, I, I probably had two defining moments. The first was that I had been doing fertility treatment for about five years. And while I didn't have any comorbid conditions, my reproductive endocrinologist sat me down and said, Estelle, it's not a matter of if you get diabetes, it's a matter of when you will get diabetes if you don't lose weight. That really struck me, especially because at that point I hadn't been successful in conceiving, which I eventually was, but it really did make me have to look at the issue of my weight. The defining moment I had was that I was very unhappy in my marriage, and I think I stayed quite a bit longer because uh, my self-esteem was poor in terms of feeling attractive and feeling like if I left the marriage, maybe I would end up in, a, in another relationship someday. And I did get to the point uh, about 10 years ago where I told my husband I wanted a divorce and he had an interesting response. He said, well, before you focus on a marriage, why don't you focus yourself to sort of eliminate the, you know, you're unhappy because there are things in your life you're unhappy with. And I said, you know, okay, you know, I'll focus on myself first and then look at the marriage. So why was bariatric surgery the answer for you in particular? You know, I wasn't that confident that I'd be able to lose significant weight because I'd never been uh, able to lose more than 15 pounds on a program. Uh, I heard so many things about people losing maybe 100 pounds on a program and gaining it all back. But when I looked into bariatric surgery, I saw that the statistics were really good in terms of the percentage of people that do not gain it all back uh, after you lose it. Uh, and, you know, granted, there can be some regain, but you have a tool for the rest of your life that if you choose to uh, honor it, reason that you would have uh, regain. So what was your biggest lifestyle change after bariatric surgery? Because we talk about lifestyle, but you have a really cool, you have some cool stuff to talk about. So my thoughts going into surgery was that I had heard that there's a honeymoon stage after surgery, meaning this is the stage where you lose the most weight and it comes off the quickest and most easily. And with that in mind, I really wanted to capitalize on that six month time right after surgery, knowing that the more effort I put in to exercise in addition to the change in eating, the more impact it was going to have long term. So I started basically uh, exercising. And what I discovered was exercising with people made it more enjoyable for me. So I didn't want to do solitary exercise. Um, and I also liked activities that didn't look like exercise. I wasn't really interested in going to the gym. So basically, I joined a running group of women 
who basically were training for a relay race. And long story short, I started out very slow using this program, the Couch to 5K program. And while I was the slowest runner in the group and could do the least distance, I ran the relay. I participated in this 200 mile relay that took two days and I ran three of the legs. And that really made me confident to start doing some other exercises. Uh, one of the things that I ended up being um, really excited about was hula hooping. Uh, not performance hula hooping, but exercise hula hooping. And uh, it hadn't really catched on, caught on in my geographic area. So I didn't really have a place to go to buy hoops. So I started making my own, which uh -huh. was win-win for me because I'm a crafter. And I made maybe 10 to begin with, and I started carrying them around with me in my car. And everywhere I went, I introduced hula hooping to people. And eventually I got a group of people to hula hoop with, which made it an exercise that, uh, that I didn't have to do alone. I even had my next door neighbor hula hooping while our kids were playing outside. When we had to, they were young enough, we had to be outside su supervising them. But instead of sitting, we were hula hooping while we were chatting. Mm -hmm. uh, one of the great things about hula hooping is that you can pretty much do it at any weight. And uh, it's, a, it's cardio and oh, yeah. low or no impact. So I found that while it got easier as I got thinner, as well as running got easier as I got thinner, you could do it at any weight. And I did a number of other things. I kind of felt like I had been living life on the sidelines for so long that I wanted to experience as much as I could. So I did things like rollerblading, uh, what do you call it, zip lining, um, kayaking. I just I took every opportunity to do an activity which wasn't just good for my health; it was good for my emotional well being. Yeah, it's, I think exercise is such great therapy. When I, I'm already like in a zone now where I'm like, I need it and I do it a lot now and I'm, I'm doing, you know, recumbent bike and whatever I can, yoga and, and, and some cardio classes and you crave it. Your body craves it. It's like the, the weirdest thing. You're like, how am I addicted to exercise? But it's a great thing to be addicted to, you know? And honestly, uh, being involved in a sport group is critical. And what I found was as I continue to exercise, People in my support group told me that I was an inspiration to them and they started exercising and feeling like I was being an inspiration really empowered me. Uh, you know, of course, it, it gave me accountability, but it, it really did empower me that the journey wasn't just about me. Well, thank you. I, you know, of course, you knew the minute I started doing the show. I mean, it was it was like, OK, Estelle, please say yes, please say yes. And I mean, I, I knew you would, but I also you know, wanted to make sure you, you wanted to come on and, and share. And I just think what you've done is great. And I love having you back. It's like, I mean, again, nothing set us split us up or anything, but it's just normal life. And now here we are. And it's almost like no time has passed. It's weird. I'm thrilled. Time to manja. Mambo, mambo, taliano, try an enchilada with the fish bacala. Bacala. Okay, Alexa, stop. Okay, I love that song. It's Rosemary Clooney. This seems to be a Clooney episode. Oh, well. So this is the dish. Now... I don't mean to seem very cocky about this one, but it's good. You're going to love it. I highly recommend it. My friend Deborah, basically, who's Italiano, her last name's Gitarelli, she invented it while we were on Weight Watchers. And then I snatched it from her and made it my own because I make it all the time. And it is low calorie, very easy to throw together, so delicious and satisfies your Italian food tooth without all the heavy pasta and all of the heaviness, okay? It's really, really good. So I call it my Italian stew, and it's got very basic things in it. It's got, um, I use chicken or turkey, so Italian sausage. You can use mild or spicy. Um, I use eggplant, zucchini, um, of course, onion, and I use carrots. Now, I happen to have gone a little crazy at Costco recently, and I bought a bunch of baby carrots, and they actually happen to be the right size, so I'm going to use them today, but of course, you can just peel carrots and make some nice chunks, and you want to make the chunks similar to what I'm going to make the other vegetables, um, and it's got garlic, and it's really simple, 
So let's do it. Okay, so first I'm going to cut up an onion, okay? And you want your knife nice and sharp. Okay, got my trash bowl here. Take off the outer stuff here. I hate to use to lose that outer layer, but sometimes you have to. Oh, that one came off nice. Okay. So now I just basically cut them into, into crescent moons, right? Again, my knife is nice and sharp. I usually flip this over. Okay, so our pan's nice and hot. By the way, while you weren't looking, I turned it up to medium high. You want it like that for the duration of cooking for the most part until you're ready to turn it down. Get those nice and... and you're gonna let those brown for a bit. Also, whenever you're cooking vegetables in a stew, you always wanna add your harder vegetables first. So I'm gonna go ahead and stick the carrots right in. Let those all get browning together. I'm gonna throw a little bit of salt. That helps bring the moisture out of the onions a little bit, not too much. I like to adjust those flavors later. A little pepper, and there you go. Now, while we're letting those saute and giving them a little quick turn, I'm gonna get the other vegetables ready. Okay, so while those are browning, I'm gonna cut up my sausage. Now, I have a package of chicken, mild Italian sausage. Now, a little tip, which I didn't do, I forgot, is sometimes it's actually better to work with frozen sausage or partially frozen sausage because you can cut them up because I'm gonna cut these into coins. But I have a very sharp knife and hopefully it'll be all right. See, not too bad. Cutting them into chunks, basically. But these are nice and fresh sausages, so the casing's gonna break a little, but that's okay because they can basically become, it can become like a rustic stew. They don't have to stay in that casing, okay? Kind of get them smushed around there. And notice I have a nice big pot. We get on a nice big pot of food because this also freezes really well. Okay, so I'm just going to give them a little incorporate them, get everyone melding together. Okay, and I'm going to do a little trick. I cheat with garlic. Okay. I know we can peel garlic, but I usually don't have the time and I don't like getting my fingers all dirty half the time. Um, and I find a lot of these chopped garlics in the jar to be totally fine. And so that's what, that's what I do a lot of the time. So I'm going to take, this is a good time to add that garlic too. You don't want to put garlic in a hot pan ever, really, really hot because it'll burn. So I like a lot of garlic. So I'm going to put like a really generous amount, like the equivalent of probably four or five cloves of garlic. Okay, that was, that was like two pretty good tablespoons of the garlic. All right, again, now you can incorporate that in. And your veggies are going to just continue to start to cook. Okay, so now I'm going to do my zucchini. Just cut the ends off. Okay, now I like to do half thick half moons. You can do it however you want, but I highly recommend a chunky bite. Otherwise, zucchini tends to basically melt and fall apart, okay? So I do a nice down the middle, and then, of course, these are the uneven ones, and then I do like a decent size. See, it's a nice size chunk of a crescent because it, kind of, it just makes a nice mouth bite. Again, this is a stew, not a soup. I just usually pick up the whole board, get those zoops in there. Again, they don't have to really saute, but it's just time to add them so that everything's cooking evenly. And last, but very much not least for me, the eggplant, okay? And some of you don't like eggplant. I think that's kind of your own thing, but that one's starting to go a little bit. Oh, there we go. That's fine. 
and I have two little ones, but you know, depends on the size of your eggplant, it depends on how much you like eggplant. So of course I have to peel this. You could leave the peel on. I don't care for eggplant peel. It's a little more bitter for me. Um, so I'm just always a, a fan of peeling. Okay, so our eggplant is now um, peeled. These are small, so I'm just gonna cut them right down the center. If you have a really, really big fat one, you kind of have to do more than one cut down the middle, so to speak. And these are always a little tricky to cut. You can just kind of wing it. I like to sort of square them off and deal with the odd pieces first. Um, and by the way, I meant to mention that you could put all kinds of other things in here. Sometimes I throw potatoes in here and they're really good. But again, right now I'm watching that kind of thing. So I'm not going to put those in. Um, mushrooms are really good. I don't really like to use mushrooms a lot though, because I do end up freezing what's left over and the mushrooms don't freeze so, um, so good. They get sort of squidgy and I don't like that. So I don't, I don't use them. But again, if you're going to eat the whole thing, I see I'm doing a nice thick, you know, big hunk kind of thing. Okay, put that eggplant in there. Nice. Okay, so the eggplant's in here. Now, so you got a nice big, it looks like a lot, but actually the vegetables are gonna cook down, especially the eggplant and the zucchini. I just get it mixed up. So now I'm kind of old school and this is how I learned this dish. I use Hunt's um, and I use the no salt added crushed. You want a can of, of crushed tomatoes, the big can, the 28 ounce, right? So now um, actually first I'm going to put in some basil. Now I use um, dry basil when I when I have it, um, in, when I don't have fresh rather, um, and I don't have fresh right now so I'm just going to use some dry basil. And actually I'm going to measure. Can't eyeball it all the time, Tammy. You gotta measure. So I, I do about about a tablespoon, maybe a little bit extra for love, for Italy. Okay. Basil. Mm, it already smells good. And then you're just gonna pour in a can of crushed, a can of crushed tomatoes, and. Here is oh, and one can of tomato sauce, which isn't really tomato sauce, it's just they pureed the tomatoes. Okay, this is just enough to get that everything coated. You'll have extra sauce, it's nice. And then the water from the vegetables will mix in and you'll have the perfect balance. Just give everything a nice coat. There you go. And now you're basically going to let this get nice and bubbly and simmer. Um, I basically turn it down to medium. you got to be careful with these nice Dutch ovens as well. You'll burn your pot. And I cover it and let it sit 15, 20 minutes so it's, until you'll hear it. You'll hear it bubbling, okay? Okay, it's been about 20 minutes. We're going to check our stew. See, it's all bubbly, all right? Now we wanted to bring this up to heat. It's already cooking down a little bit. Give it a nice, good stir. Okay, cover back on, and now turn it down to medium low. Because now it just needs to simmer for about another 15 to 20 minutes. Now the final touch is to taste it and adjust the salt and pepper as needed. I love when they say that when it's something that's raw and you can't really taste it. But this you can. Okay, kind of a stir. Um, and just so you know, yes, I'm going to taste it out of the serving spoon. That's because I'm in my own home, but obviously, hopefully chefs in the kitchen don't do that. Or maybe they do. Needs a little salt. Needs a little salt. Don't want to go too heavy on the salt, though, because we are going to top this up with some Parmesan. The Parmesan is salty, but it does need a couple good turns here. I have my nice coarse grinder. Ah, there we go. Okay, so we've mixed it, gotten that salt in there. And by the way, I didn't mention this, but I believe the original recipe that Deborah created had red crushed pepper in it. I don't put red crushed pepper in my food too much because I, um, I like spicy food, but it doesn't like me. But you're welcome to do it. 
Plus I have to pick when I eat spicy food carefully. Okay, so this is a good portion and I've made sure I have an equal amount of everything. And now the final touch, that's my favorite. So I have two different ways of putting Parmesan on here. I got some um, shaved Parmesan, which is nice. I actually like it. Pardon my fingers, I'm gonna do it. And I like to put a little bit of that on, right? Just for some chunkiness. And then I have some fresh Parmesan. Of course, you can use the other kind in the green can or whatever you like, that's fine. I like to go big or go home here, so. And then just shave some fresh on there. Oh my God, it smells so good in here. And it's gonna be so good. Fun fact, by the way, Parmesan cheese is one of the least high calorie cheeses. The harder the cheese, the lower the calories. That means it doesn't have a lot of fat in it. Um, and another you know, a tip from my former Weight Watcher days is that you can actually use a pretty decent amount of Parmesan before it starts to become really high calorie. And so there you have it. It's ready to go and we're gonna try it. Let's give it a taste. I mean, I already know how it's gonna taste, but I'll taste it for you. Let's have this bite. I love eggplant and it's like baby eggplant parmesan's going on here. Mm -hmm. Mm. It's hot. <laughs> <laughs> it's so good. And by the way, you know, there's extra sauce going on here. I kind of like to eat it as soupy kind of, but of course, if you are not super duper watching your weight and you can afford it, the calories, of course, a nice crusty loaf of Italian bread goes killer with this, but right now I'm not eating that way, so it's delicious just like this. You don't have to have the bread. You actually don't even miss it, honestly. And there you have it, my killer Italian stew, perfect for the, for the fall, for a nice cold night, um, and it's just really, really healthy and delicious.